Hey everybody, welcome to Chatbox, I'm David Cruz. It's 2023 and in progressive New Jersey, this year's legislative elections will result in at least 20% fewer women representatives. Here's another fun fact for you. New Jersey has never elected a woman to the U.S. Senate and so far has elected just one female governor. As they say around the way, what's up with that? Let's get into it with our panel. Republican Assembly Member Nancy Munoz is Deputy Minority Leader. Democratic Assembly Member Verlina Reynolds Jackson is a former Deputy Majority Leader. And Patricia Campos Medina is President of Latina Civic Association. Ladies, welcome to you all. When this legislature is, was sworn in last year, people were heralding the increase in female lawmakers. Now we're about to see a decrease of at least 20%. Some of this is politics, but it's not all politics. Some women are stepping back on their own. Others are being shown the door. What are the challenges facing women trying to get into and once they're in, advancing in the world of politics? Let's start with you, Assemblywoman uh, Jackson. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, getting into uh uh, partisan politics is difficult, but it's about the work, right? It's about the advocacy. It's about making sure we have representation. It's about breaking those barriers, and it's about us supporting one another once we get in. But it's about us making sure that we are supportive in those efforts. We're advocates. We want to make sure that we fight for our communities, and we do that loud and clear, making sure that the community is supporting us. And I think that's when you have great representation. Assemblywoman uh, Munoz, what do you think? Well, I, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you for having us. Um, but, you know, you talk about the number of women who are won't be in the legislature. However, you know, on my side of the aisle, we have 28 women who have filed to run for the assembly. So, you know, at the same, while, while we're losing some, we may be gaining others. And I think we're, you know, I think that's really an important message. You know, we've got women who are motivated to run because of, uh, you know, they call them uh, tabletop issues, kitchen table issues, you know, issues about education and about uh, affordability in the state of New Jersey. So while, you know, we see a fair number of women who are stepping aside, whether by, on their own or because they're being forced out um, by, you know, for whatever reason, we also see that there are, you know, certainly on my side of the island, I'm certainly certain on the other side, there's a number of women who are stepping up as well. Patricia Campos, you're on a mission to recruit more women to run. Uh, what obstacles are you finding? The fact is, is that more women since uh, Hillary Clinton uh, laws have stepped up and decided to run for office, even here in New Jersey. So we were in a good trend. The Center for American Women in Politics recently issued a report in which he actually said that we were on a downtrend uh, even here in New Jersey. And I think that we know why that is happening. One of it is, of course, once they get elected, um, creating a mentoring uh, a process in which they are successful staying in office and also address some of the issues that they have wearing office. But also, there are significant structural problems for women to run for office. One of them is the, the lack of access to uh, money to run. The party line in New Jersey is a big problem for women to, uh, to run and be able to win on their own. So we are seeing women stepping back because they had personal reasons to do it, but there's also structural reasons for why they're doing it. Uh, and we need to not just say we, we need mentoring, but we also, what is the, how do we set up the process for mentoring, and also how do we uh, create a system in which women can raise money and run on their own, and once, and also uh, be able to challenge the party system that awards the line to um, and the primaries to whoever they want to run in the primaries, and often those are not women who are running on the party line. Yeah, uh, Assemblywoman Sadaf Jaffer was on with Brianna Venosi this week. I'm sure. Some of you know her story. She's bowing out after one term. Uh, let's hear a little bit of her reasoning, uh, and then we'll come back. It's been tough. It's scary. I think that, um, you know, you kind of see the worst of humanity in terms of the prejudice that people have. And, you know, anyone who's in public service, it's, it is a sacrifice. It's time away from your family. It's uh, something that you do to serve the public. And when you face that sort of 
targeted harassment based on your race or your religion, ethnicity, gender, um, it it really um, gets to you. All right, Assemblywoman Munoz, what, what do you think when you hear a clearly bright young woman say that this is too much for her and for her family? Well, I, and, uh, you know, I've worked with her. She's on a, uh, the health committee with me, and I, I can appreciate um, her service to, to the state. And, you know, we, I think it goes beyond just, you know, your race, your ethnicity, your religion. It also is because sometimes it's just the party that you're in. You know, I get, I'm a Republican and people make assumptions about Republican women. And, you know, we're not a homogenous group. We're a very uh, broad spectrum of, of ideas and beliefs. And, you know, I think that we have to make sure the public understands that, that we're not all the same. And, and I think that that's a really important message that we have to get out. We represent our constituents in our district. You know, um, I bring, I think we all represent a different part of the state. And, you know, it's, I think if you reflect that part of the state, um, then you can be successful as a woman. You know, and we talk about uh, mentoring, you know, I started the Women's Republican Women's Caucus, and I started it after we got, ele we have 11 women in my caucus this uh, term and three uh, female senators. And there, so there are 14 of us, and I've got us together to share collective ideas. But per, in particular, since I have the most experience in the legislature as a woman, um, as the female legislator, I've, I've, I've given them a lot of advice and guidance. And I think that that's really important. That And as uh, Verlina said, is to mentor others, but to, to not just to say it, but to actually do it. And to make sure you're out there providing guidance, who to listen to and how to, and, and, and to the point about raising money. Um, you know, I raise money and I make sure that I, sh I get that money to those competitive districts where I can help those candidates. You know, that's part of our role as leaders in the legislature. When we um, tweeted out about this show, some people tweeted back at us and said that the environment in Trenton, the legislature uh, and in government in general is toxic. Do, do uh -huh. you feel that and see that? It's hard, you know, being in these elected positions is very hard. I mean, you know, we represent the people. And so sometimes you don't always agree with what's happening. And so you have to make those hard choices. But at the end, you know, we're talking about all of the intersectionalities that come together. And we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And so that you can sleep at night and that you do represent well. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the votes that we take may be, um, it's a bigger opportunity for everyone. Everyone, both sides of the aisle don't always agree. Um, but again, it's about the collect collectiveness of it all, us coming together. And I have to say, Ms. Campos, you are absolutely right in terms of the financing that happens. You know, I am in a competitive district with complacency. And so although I have a heavy Democratic um, uh, 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 district, the ability to raise money is very, very hard. And so that becomes challenging when I'm still trying to get the message out about affordability, when I'm talking about commerce and making sure that we have representation in business, in finance, in education. Um, it doesn't mean that these things aren't needed just because I, I, I'm in a, a Democratic district. We still have to faith, uh, fight for these things. And that's throughout the whole state of New Jersey. So I represent, I'm elected by one district, but I represent the entire state of New Jersey. And so we still need help and we still need to collaborate, whether we're talking about Salem County, Bergen County, or Hunterdon County. County. All of these things um, are still representative of us. And that's what the fight is all about. And it's hard. It's hard. I'm not going to even lie about that. It's hard. It's but hard. Three, but Theresa, you, you, you brought up the money question. Um, there's a lot of new rules and, and, and um, regulations, but uh, they're more lax than ever. Uh, we, we were talking this week with the uh, former commissioner of ELEC, and I know that you all know what happened uh, with that commission, but yeah. just because the money people can give more doesn't mean that women are getting more. Isn't that right, Patricia? And that's exactly it. Um, fundraising is about the network that you have, and it's about the professionals that are connected to the political networking and are, are, are investing in the leadership of women. So the, when you are, we at Latina Civic um, do have a, a political action committee, then also we have 
an initiative called Latinas Building the Bench, in which we are training Latinas to go out and put themselves in a position that they can actually run and attract and know how to fundraise money through our training programs. Now, uh, the way men attract money for their campaigns is that they get put on positions of leadership and they get put in charge of things. And that's how the, the political class or the consultants gives them money. What, the, what we need to do is to see more women in political office that have the power to make choices so people can invest in them. The other thing is, now, the way you get to leadership position is that women have to last. They have to be reelected. They have to be able to to uh, to uh, have a, a professional stability, and they have to be able to have a record of legislation. The problem that we have in New Jersey is that women can move around, and they don't. They do not let very few women get the ability to move up in leadership. We are losing Latinas in the legislature. We have never sent a Latina to Congress in New Jersey. So if you really want to create a path in which women have leadership positions, you also cannot just move them around and replace them. And yeah. that's where I, we have a problem with the, the way the political party is and the, and the party line works, that they decide when and how to move women out of office. And we, have, we are losing two women who were replaced in the legislature for our Latina. And we actually have Assemblywoman Mosquera, who, because she got a very difficult district, decided that she's not going to run for re-election. Yeah. That is a loss in, in skills, it's a loss in uh, in leadership, and, it's a, and, it's, and it's, it makes it so much harder to get other Latinas to be able to be able to fundraise money. All right. I'm running out of time, but I wanted uh, to get this question in. Um, once you get into the legislature, uh, and this is for our lawmakers, obviously, uh, there's a whole other system of advancement there that, as Patricia brought up, affects your ability to raise and distribute funds. But uh, let me start with you on this, Assemblywoman Munoz, because a lot of people noticed how you were passed over uh, for someone else for minority leader. Uh, was that politics or sexism? Um, I think it was politics, honestly. Um, I think I had a good reputation. You know, I, it, it was, in my opinion, it was um, politics. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I think that being, be, being a leader is showing leadership skills as well. And so I make my, make sure my voice is heard. You know, I, I always make sure that I have a, a voice in the room. And I think that's, you know, in senior leadership, I'm the only female. And I do feel like I make sure one of my roles I consider is to make sure that when I look at my caucus, that their voices are heard as well. So, you know, I, I've taken on that role, as I said, as a mentor, but also is to make sure that, like, just because the men's voices are louder and deeper doesn't mean that they can interrupt the woman, the women in the room. So I'm very careful about that. I make sure that I point that out. And so, you know, I I think the assertion, the, my personality um comes through because, you know, I was a nurse, which was a predominantly female profession in a heavily, at the time when I was starting a predominantly male uh, healthcare system. And so we learned to be assertive and to have our voices heard because it was for the benefit of the patient. And now as a legislator, I have to make sure my voice is heard as for the constituents across the state. Um, because again, women bring a different perspective to many, many things. And I think having women in leadership is really important to get those perspectives heard and understood. Assemblywoman Jackson, your party's leadership, the speaker, the Senate president, the governor, three old dudes. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a Senate majority leader, but Democrats have all the levers of power and the leadership. While there aren't many women in the room at the end of the budget process, I mean, uh, and women put them in power. Right. So I, I have to say, you know, I did speak up and speak out about that. Um, and that's why I'm on the budget committee. I did. Uh, I asked for it. And I think that's what we have to do. We're going out. Sometimes you have to do a quick and dirty and see who's Who's on this committee? How are we making these decisions? Do we have the right right set of lenses on it? And who's missing? I think oftentimes women, you know, do I what else do I need to do? We don't need to do anything but step up into those leadership roles. Sometimes you ask and sometimes you have to make your point across very loud and clear about why we need to be at the table, setting the menu and talking about those financial issues that's going to impact all of us. Those type of things don't come from just 
just one lens and you need us and you need black women, you need Latino women, you need women at the table to bring all those intersectionalities together to make an informed decision. So sometimes you ask and then sometimes you just tell them this is what you're going to do. Then this is why you need us. All right. Still a ways to go. Nancy Munoz, Verlina Reynolds Jackson and Patricia Campos Medina. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. A new documentary about an old friend opens in theaters this weekend. It's called It Ain't Over, and it tells the remarkable story of one Lorenzo Pietro Berra, known to most of us simply as Yogi. The 2015 All-Star Game features the four greatest living baseball players. Hank Aaron, Johnny Bench, Sandy Koufax, and Willie Mays, who are all absolutely amazing players in their own right but I'm in the room sitting next to my grandfather, Yogi Berra. And I'm thinking, wait a second. He's got more MVPs than any of these guys. He's won more World Series rings than all four of them combined. And I look at him and I said, are you dead? And he said, not yet. One of the greatest World Series resumes of any player ever. Hey, he got it done. He was a winner because he had all the rings to prove it. He's the figure that was larger than life. There's no Jackie without the acceptance of Yogi Berra. When Yogi comes to the team, they say he doesn't look like a Yankee. He wasn't six foot three with blonde hair. Everything about him was kind of funny. He was a character. He was made fun of in the New York press. But that sort of became who Yogi Berra was, this funny little guy. That's right, Yogi Berra. I don't think Yogi liked it too much. The Yogiisms. Let's talk about the Yogiisms. He said, nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's too crowded. When you get to a fork in the road, take it. What? And it ain't over till it's over. It makes a lot of sense. Lindsay Berra is a sports journalist whose work has been seen on MLB.com and ESPN the magazine. She is executive producer of It Ain't Over, which tells the life story of her grandpa, Yogi Berra, and she joins us now. Lindsay, good to meet you. Welcome to Chatbox. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. So I've been a baseball fan for pretty much my whole life, and I'm 11 years old. Uh, a Mets <laughs> fan, to be more precise. And we claim Yogi as a great Met, too, but the back of that baseball card, over 19 seasons, averaging, and I didn't really realize this until I, I started delving into this a little bit, he averaged 27 home runs, 109 RBIs, batted 285 with an on-base percentage of 348, and averaged 32 strikeouts per season. 10 yeah. World Series, three MVPs. I mean, that is no joke. My my favorite season, I mean, averaging 32 strikeouts is pretty cool. But in 1950, in 656 plate appearances, he hit 322. He had 124 RBIs, 28 home runs, and he struck out only 12 times in the entire season. And that, to me, is just absolutely mind-blowing. And he did not win one of his MVPs in 1950. Wow. He won the next year in 51 and in 54 and 55. But that, that season is just incredible. I don't think anyone will ever do that again. Yeah, I mean, just for me, who was a baseball fan, uh, just kind of getting to know the player again um, was incredible. Is that part of the goal of, of this film is to, hey, <laughs> look at this guy's baseball card. Yes, I, I think that um, because Grandpa uh, was in commercials and he was a manager and he was kind of became a pop culture icon for in, yeah. in the 45, 50 years after he stopped playing baseball, I think there's kind of a recency bias. And that's what's in people's minds, that he was this funny guy who said funny things. And they don't immediately think of what a tremendous baseball player he was. So my goal with the documentary is to remind people that he was absolutely, you know, arguably, I think, the greatest catcher of all time, but that as good as he was on the baseball field, he was an even better human being. Yeah, he was a humble guy from very humble beginnings. How much was that a part of, of his persona? I mean, he enlisted in the Navy before spring training. Yeah, I, I think it, it was a big part of who he was. Uh, he was a first-generation Italian immigrant 
as you mentioned, he actually volunteered to serve in the Navy before he had a chance to be drafted, and he ended up off of Omaha Beach during the D-Day invasion. He was a machine gunner providing cover fire for our troops going ashore. He had this beautiful 65-year love story with my Grammy Carmen. Uh, he was a wonderful father, a wonderful grandfather. Um, and there's so much about his story as an immigrant, as a veteran, as a husband, as a dad, that can appeal to folks who really aren't baseball fans. And I think how relatable he was and, and how normal he seemed was really what so endeared him to people over the years, even though he was this baseball you know, great baseball player. Yeah, I mean, really is an American, a true American uh, success story. I remember Yogi mostly as a lovable ex-Yankee, uh, but the film talks about how the press and others really made fun of him as a player, and not yeah. in a lovable way. Did that bother him, and, and did it bother you growing up? So... Some of those things that you're you're alluding to were really not very nice. He they the the press said that he looked like a gorilla. He looked like yeah. an ape. Um, he looked like a fat girl running in a too tight skirt. They said he was too ugly to be a Yankee. I can't even figure out what that last one even means. Yeah, too ugly. Because Joe Yankee. DiMaggio was not um, that handsome a fella, but <laughs> well, I people think of Joe DiMaggio <laughs> as kind of dashing. Yeah. But um, yeah. no, it, it, Grandpa was really able to let things roll off of his back. He very famously said, "I never saw anyone hit with his face." Yeah. And he just kind of went out there and went about his his business and silenced all the critics with his play on the field. I think a lot of that goes back to his service in the war. I don't think that you can face a real life or death situation without coming home with an altered perspective and a profound sense of gratitude yeah. that you made it out when so many other men did not. And I think that just gave him the ability to approach the rest of his life, which I think he viewed a little bit as borrowed time with just an amazing amount of joy. And I don't think it was ever lost on him that he was playing a kid's game for a living, getting paid to do something he loved. And I think that was what he thought about. I don't think he cared what anyone else thought. Yeah, your love and admiration is, is clear right now as we talk, but also uh, in the film. What was your relationship with him like? Was there ever a time when he was just Pop Pop or, or Gramps? Oh, he still is. When I was a little girl, I didn't know that Grandpa Yogi was also this famous guy. I knew he was the coach of the Yankees, but I just thought that that was his job, the way my friend's grandpas were accountants or school yeah. teachers or bus drivers or whatever they were. And by the time I was old enough to realize that Grandpa Yogi was also this guy, Yogi Berra, who won 10 World Series championships, the two guys, Grandpa Yogi and Yogi Berra, didn't often really meet and shake hands in my mind. Yeah. And obviously now I'm a grown up. I, I know that he was this famous person. But when I have memories of, you know, him burning hot dogs at family barbecues or playing wiffle ball in the yard, that's Grandpa Yogi. And when I talk about the guy with all the baseball accolades, that's Yogi Berra. Um, but I was very lucky to have him until I was uh, 39 years old. Yeah. So I got to have a really tremendous adult relationship with my Grandpa Yogi and really understand who he was and where he came from. And it's something I'm very grateful for. The film uh, spends a lot of time on his relationship with the Yankees, the only team he ever played for, uh, but who overall treated him pretty badly considering what he did for that franchise. I mean, he, he in his first year as a manager, he took them to Game 7 of the World Series, then got dumped pretty much the yeah. next day when the Yankees hired the guy from the Cardinals who had just beaten the Yankees. I mean, and don't even get me started on Steinbrenner. Yeah, that was Johnny Keene who got yeah. who got that job. But then, you know, you just mentioned you're a Mets fan. If that hadn't happened, Grandpa wouldn't have really? his, wouldn't have had his time with the Mets. Yeah, and he really, you know, I tell everyone, Grandpa was very proud of his time with the, with the Mets. He was only the second manager in history to bring teams from both leagues to the World Series. And it was something that he was tremendously proud of. And he had wonderful relationships with Buddy Harrelson and Ron Sabota yeah. and Art Chamsky. I think he thought of them all as, you know, li like sons. And those relationships continued until he passed away. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. That was just the journey he was on. And we can look back at it and go, man, that kind of stunk. But Grandpa always made the best of everything. And then um, the whole thing with Steinbrenner, where he was fired 18 games into the season, and he vowed never to come back and then the 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 film uh, talks about their their reunion, and that's a real touching moment uh, in in the film as well. 
It is. It, it meant a lot to Grandpa for George to finally come out to the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center and apologize for the way he'd been fired. Now, Grandpa didn't care that he had been fired. That yeah. was a baseball decision. He cared that George sent Clyde King, the assistant general manager and a good friend of my grandfather's at the time, to tell him that he was fired. Grandpa was upset that George didn't come and tell him himself. He thought that was disrespectful and just not the way to do business. Um, but as soon as George came out to the museum and said, I'm sorry for that, it was water under the bridge. It was like it had never happened. And Grandpa was back at Yankee Stadium and back at spring training. And it was really wonderful for him later in life for that to, to be able to do that. He was able to teach those younger Yankees, Jorge Posada, Derek Jeter, Nick Swisher, so much about baseball. But at the same time, just the joy he got from being at the ballpark, I always say, probably added about a decade to his life. And, and I mean, that's terrific. There are so many voices here. I mean, Jeter, Guidry, Mattingly, Torrey. Uh, uh, not too hard to get them to talk, I would imagine. No, Sean Mullen, our director, uh, jokes that when you get folks in, the, in an interview about my grandpa, all you have to do is say Yogi and start the tape because they just start running. But um, it was really important to me to get as many folks as possible who had either seen grandpa play or actually played with him. So first order of business for me was Vin Scully, the legendary Dodgers mm -hmm. announcer who was 92 or 93 years old when we started filming. And it was very important to me to get him first. Um, but then guys like Ralph Terry, Tony Kubek, Bobby Richardson, but also like Roger Angel was a columnist for The New Yorker for many, many, many years. He was 100 years old when we interviewed him, and he had covered New York baseball since he got out of World War II. So there were a lot of voices uh, who could really speak to what Grandpa looked like as an athlete on the field and how he was able to elevate the play of the folks around him and how important he was to that Yankees lineup for so many years. Did you ever discuss with him how much a guy who averaged 27, 109, and 285 would be making in today's baseball world? I never really discussed it with with Grandpa. I heard people ask him, and they just sort of you know would laugh it off. But the Twitterverse is constantly telling me that Grandpa Yogi, with the number of World Series wins that he has, would be unpayable in yeah. today's yeah. Uh, game. And I'm like, you know, un I don't know. I, don't, I can't really wrap my brain around that either. But his best year in the big leagues, he made sixty thousand dollars. And most years, it was more like forty five, forty eight thousand, which is you know the equivalent of about I don't know four eighty today, yeah. four hundred eighty thousand which is a good living, but it's certainly not 30 million. <laughs> a great story. Uh, the film's called It Ain't Over. It's got a lot of heart and a lot of charm. It opens wide this weekend, and Lindsay Berra is the executive producer. Lindsay, great to meet you. Thanks for bringing this. Thanks so much for having me, everybody. Go to the movies. And that's Chatbox for this week. Thanks to Verlina Jackson, Nancy Munoz, and Patricia Campos Medina for joining us as well. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay and get new content every day when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm David Cruz from all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.